I'm 48 years old. I responded down to Ground Zero 9-11 on September 11th, 2001. Uh, I was a police officer. It was a, uh, it was a Tuesday and I went to, uh, it was a delegates meeting for the whole state. So around eight o'clock, we got, I got into a car and it was a Riverdale police officer and we were driving to Edison to go to a, a PBA meeting for the whole state. And we heard it on the radio that uh, a plane had hit the, the trade center. And <clears throat> we were about probably about 45 minutes from uh, the PBA meeting. And by the time we got there, uh, it was probably like maybe 9.15, 9.20 and everything had already happened. Like uh, everybody knew, you know, that the, both buildings had been hit and that uh, they were telling different police departments, you know, to go back to your <clears throat> prospective police department and see what they want, want you to do. And at the time there was some type of, uh, I guess it was like a teletype from the state of New York saying that uh, if you were 45 miles from New York city, you know, and you were, uh, 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 what do you call it? A, uh, a first responder or police officer, they wanted you to, you know, they asked for help. So I left Edison and I drove back to my police department. And uh, when I got there, <clears throat> my two brothers had come from uh, their police departments. I didn't know they were coming to mine, but they had come to my police department. And uh, we were going to go down to ground zero, you know, at around, like, I guess it was like maybe like 11 o'clock or whatever. And we were getting dressed in my police department. We were going to go down to you know New York City to, to find my father. My father was a, a Port Authority police officer and he was working at the Holland Tunnel. And all their radio communications had been shot that day because of the towers. When they fell, there was no radio communication. So there was no cell phones communications either. So we, I couldn't get a hold of my dad and we didn't know if he was alive or dead. So we jumped in the car. The three of us, uh, we took my brother Chris's car he was driving, put a little red light on top of it, and uh, we head down to New York City. Uh, when we got to like one and nine, I remember that they had all the roads were closed and you couldn't get through it. So we were driving on the wrong side of the road to get to where these two police officers had blocked everything and were making everybody go down. I think it was Fish House road or something like that yeah, on the wrong side of the road. and we were on the wrong side of the road going down and they saw us and they stopped us and they saw that we were police officers and they opened up the cones and they kind of gave us a salute you know and said good luck and then we went we were like the only cars on one and nine and then we got to the holland tunnel and as soon as we got to the holland tunnel uh we were like three blocks away and uh i just saw the left hand of or on the right side, there was a car coming and I knew that it was going to hit us. I just, I just knew like it, it was happening really fast. And I grabbed my brother's wheel and, uh, you know, when I, the second I grabbed the wheel to, to, to pull it down, this lady hit us from the side and spun us around into a telephone pole. And, uh, when we got out, there was all smoke and everything. And, you know, my brother, Chris thought that I had caused the accident by, pulling the wheel he didn't even know we were hit like it happened so quick he was like what did you do and i was like we just got hit that lady ran a red light yeah and uh so so we uh we got out of the car to go look at her and she was covered in dust and i didn't understand at the time you know why she was dressed like that or what was wrong with her and she was hysterically crying and she had explained to us that she had just got out of the city and she didn't know any other way to get home and had all the roads blocked off and she was just going straight and that's what she was doing and she was a school teacher i believe and uh she, she hit us and uh when she hit us the police officer that was standing on the post had had witnessed it and he came over and he was like oh my god you guys are right and we're like yeah we're you know we're here to find my dad and he was like who are you and we're like well mike magnus son and he was like oh my god yeah you see your dad's alive he goes uh i haven't seen him but uh He's definitely alive. He's somewhere, you know, I'll try, I try to get a hold of him, but, you know, the radios are down. And as he was talking to us, my dad just happened to pull up in the police car and he was looking and he was so shocked to see that it was us, you know? So he was like, what are you, what are you doing here? And we were like, uh, dad, you all right? And he was, he was covered in dust too. And he was just like, he was in shock. He was like, uh, they're all gone. He was just, uh, Neil, 
McNeil, Webb, Foreman, those were his partners that he worked with at the Holland Tunnel. And he was with them for, for, for 21 years. And if you back up in 93, my dad had uh, done the, the World Trade Center when it was bombed. And uh, those three guys also did it with him. And my dad would always talk about, like, when he watched on TV, he would see, like, this, you know, fat lady, and they were carried by two New York City policemen. And my dad would always say, you know, those New York City cops always got the, the you know, the, the glamour. He goes, we took that lady, you know, 89 stories down. We got to the bottom of the trade center and there was New York police saying like, oh, we got her from here. And they walked outside and, you know, they were on TV. And my dad said, if you watch all the 93 bombing, all you'll see is New York City police, but you'll never see Port Authority. We were always up top bringing everyone down. And then New York got all the credit for it. And I remember him always saying that. And then when, when it happened in, you know, 2001, you know, because those were the guys he went over in 93 and they, you know, they set up a perimeter and they set up this and they did all the stuff over there because they were from the Holland Tunnel. And it wasn't there was it wasn't that it wasn't their jurisdiction. It was most it was a different port of port authority, but it wasn't their sector, I guess you could say. So they went over there in 93 and they, you know, set up a, a thing and, uh, you know, they had a different sergeant and everything. So on 2001, when it happened, you know, my dad was just about ready to get in a car with those three individuals. And a, a, a sergeant showed up and told him, you know, Mike, you stay back and get rid of the traffic. And he said for, you know, McNeil, uh, Foreman and Webb to go. And they went and uh, they died. And my dad has that guilt, you know, that the survivor's guilt that, it, you know, had he been in the car with him, he'd be dead too. So anyway, we got to the city, I guess around one o'clock i remember my first you know after you know the car accident and everything i remember getting into the car with my my dad and i said you know we want the three of us want to go to the city and help out so he drove us into new york city and uh i remember the first thing i saw coming out of the holland tunnel was uh there was a guy in civilian clothes he was wearing uh he, he i guess he maybe maybe was homeless or something but he was he was directing traffic in the middle of the street he was wearing like camouflage shorts and you could see that he he wasn't a cop, but he was standing in the middle of the street directing traffic. And I looked at my dad. I said, who's that? And he said, I don't know. And I said, well, what's he doing? He goes, it looks like he's directing traffic. And I was like, is, is he allowed? He goes, everyone's trying to help out right now. You know, so I, I just found it weird that there was just civilians in the middle of the street, you know, in New York City directing traffic. And when I say directing traffic, you know, my, my dad was listening to him. He was in a cop car. And he would stop like the guy was had his hand up like for him to stop and he was everyone listened to him you know it was, it was just something strange that you know because the lights were out there were no lights you know so uh my dad brought us into the city and he dropped us off and we were probably a couple of blocks from you know ground zero as they called it and uh it was just uh it was crazy we walked uh you know there was certain size you couldn't walk by it because the fire was so hot that the heat like you turn around and you come to this one block and it was just so hot you couldn't advance anymore. So you'd have to turn around and go to where you could, you know, like get to it. And uh, I remember seeing a plane tire in the middle of the street. Like that was one of the first things I saw. And you, you couldn't not know it was a plane tire. It was, it was a plane. It was a huge plane tire. And uh, it was just, you know, it was crazy. We uh, started looking for people. And, uh, you know, I remember seeing it like there was a couple of people that had been, you know, dead, but they, they, uh, it just looked like they were laying down. I guess maybe something had hit, hit them in the head. Like they weren't in the building. They might have been at the, the bottom of the street walking and the towers fell and they hit them and they were laying there. And it was just, I remember like seeing this lady and I was seeing her, she was alive and I, you know, was feeling her pulse and she was dead. And, there was a lot of dead people like that. And there was a hole in the middle of the street. I remember that was like, it was like, it went down like 50 stories or whatever. I just knew if I fell on that, they would never find me again. So you had to watch where you were walking because you didn't want to fall into a void. And at the same time, as we were walking, there was glass that was falling. And I mean, big, 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 like things of glass because we were walking by the buildings and the buildings had all the windows blown out. And we would be walking and all of a sudden 
just shit would fall and it didn't hit us but it would land like 10 feet in front of me and i'm talking like a piece of glass that was like you know like the size of a car and it would land and i was like holy shit you know that that was close and uh we looked for people up until i didn't find anybody alive there was we 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 didn't find anybody alive uh we just saw you know a bunch of a bunch of dead people civilians um it was really hard to comprehend that too because just the way the city was it looked like uh looked like a movie set like it just didn't look real it was just it was uh it was frustrating in, in the least to, to look at it and know that that was you know new york city and it was uh yeah it was it was quite it was it was crazy um so then i remember the three of us walked around looking for people like climbing over different buildings going into buildings searching voids and then uh i guess not separated. i don't know when i we we i i what i do remember was i i don't know if i was with my brother mark or chris but i remember building seven i guess it was like five o'clock in the afternoon and uh we we, we were walking towards building seven and uh we heard three like distinct horns like loud loud horns like like you know wah, 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 and and uh and i i i thought they had find found people and i was like what the hell is that and he's like i don't know he goes i may, maybe they found people so we started like hurrying up walking towards the sounds and as we were walking towards it we could feel the the, the ground starting to tremble and then all of a sudden we looked up and we saw all these people like coming around the corner of the city and they were running you know and they were we looked at them and they were like run you know so i turned around i started running and i could feel the earth like started to tremble and that building fell and we were only a couple of blocks from it like uh and i remember when the building fell uh i was running for my life and uh i don't know what road it was it might have been the west side highway but uh, a fire engine had, had 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 i saw was you know like going down the street and they saw us running and they slowed down and uh i ran to the back of the fire truck with my brother and we jumped on the fire truck and and uh they took off down the road and they stopped like because when we jumped on the fire truck we just escaped all that smoke like that 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 debris and all that stuff like we had jumped on the fire truck and they had taken off down the west side highway and then they stopped on the side of the road and uh you know we were hugging him we were like dude thank you so much and he's like that was a close one you know we're like yeah and I, I honestly after that i don't really remember much I, I i can't i can't visually remember i, I mean i stayed in the city from five o'clock till at least like two o'clock in the morning you know after the building fell but i really don't remember all of that yeah, I, hospital. I just don't i remember getting off the fire truck and then i just have a void i don't remember I don't remember. And uh any of your other brothers want to add and yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll i put my I'll put my brother Mark on. He's my youngest <clears> one. <throat> Hold on one second. How are you all, Mark? I'm Mark Magnet. On 9-11, you wanted to um I was it was my second day of the police academy. And uh so we didn't know anything yet. So I was uh in the academy for juvenile detention. So about nine uh, I guess when the first plane hit the I got a phone call in the academy. So they, you know, they're obviously they're yelling at me. They're like, you got a phone call. What do you think you're special? So I get to the phone. It was my brother, Chris. And he told me that uh, a plane hit the world, you know, hit the, uh, one of the towers. So then I went back into my classroom for the academy. And then I got a second phone call that the second plane hit and went back into the class, told the class that everyone was like, what are you crazy? I'm like, no, suppose you know, I said a plane hit. We had no clue because there was no TVs. And then the third phone call I got is when the first tower, when the, uh, I guess tower two, the, whatever tower collapsed first. So then my brother said, I'm, I'm coming to get you at the police academy. So he came, we talked to the director, they closed the academy. And uh, at the time I'm, I was working for Joe Clark and we called my director at the detention center, my brother Chris did, Joe Clark, and he said, go, you know, go find your father. So at that point, me and my brother, Chris, left the police academy and we headed to South Mountain Reservation to see what we could see and, you know, to see what the damage was. And we, we got, when we got there, we were just amazed that we were like, holy shit, there's nothing left. 
So we didn't know the extent of it because I didn't have a TV or you know anything. I just left the academy. <clears throat> so then, like as Mike was telling you, from that point on, me and Chris, you know, we met up with Mike, and uh, same thing. We, we um, when we got to the Pompton Lakes Police Department, we went. To the, I remember we went to the first aid squad and we filled up my brother's truck with all kinds of tree, you know, triage stuff to bring with us just in case you know they needed extra stuff, and. Um, so then um, we got to the city and like Mike was saying, when we got out of the Holland Tunnel, it, it was like a movie set. It was something you can't even, you can't even imagine. It was uh, just, it was, it was surreal. And I, I was the one that was running with Mike from when the building was falling on the fire truck. So um, it's uh, up until that point, like Mike said, I don't, at that point, I don't know how I got home, how I got to my car. I don't remember. I don't remember days afterwards. Like I just don't remember that whole, that, that, the whole time afterwards. And, um, and that's really it. Mike pretty much summed everything up of what we saw. Does, did Chris want to add anything? Yeah, he does. Hold on. Hi. How are you? Thanks for having us. Number Thank one. Thank you. Um. So I was. Uh, six months seven i don't know maybe a year on the job and i was working at the gibraltar building which i worked for the essex county sheriff's department so i was working the employee entrance which i believe was academy street i was working with an officer a female i mean i don't know if you want me to say names i know names of i remember a lot so i'm working with evelyn and and a lady comes in and uh she says oh my god a small plane just hit the trade center i was living with my father in 93 when the bombing happened and that was one of the scariest days of my life because he didn't come home and we knew he was involved with that me and my stepmother and uh you know when he came home he said the sons of bitches he goes or you know they wanted to bring our towers down where it's country you know but he was real upset you know like my brother said he was upset about the glory on other people and you know but he always talked about like you know they're never going to stop till they bring the towers down and i i was living with my dad a lot so i had to hear him all the time you know, and uh, when that lady said a small plane hit, I looked at her, I said, that was no accident. We're under attack. She goes, oh, no, no, sweetie. It was an accident. I said, I don't think so. I ran in off my post. Now, when you're working a courthouse and you're assigned to these security posts, you are the officer with a gun. You can't leave. So I ran in and I looked at the security guard with no gun. I go, I got to go. We're under attack. And she goes, yo, you'll get fired if you run off your post. I said, I, I got to go. And I ran into the command center and my captain, he was, he was real strict. And he says, what are you doing off your post? And I was screaming, we're under attack. And they were looking at me like I was nuts. And all the guys are like, dude, relax. You know, it's a small plane. I said, no, they're like, well, we're going upstairs to the judge's chambers because they had like a TV up there. So we all went up there. The time they got the TV situated, tower two was hit. And that's when they were like, uh, or whatever tower was hit. And they were like, Oh my God. And then we stayed there and we watched them fall. We heard about the Pentagon and we were all in disbelief, like, Oh my God. And I was mad at my captain, especially when the buildings fell because, you know, I was just like, really, I wanted to leave and go find my father. And he held me back, but he was like, looked at me and he says, Magna, get out of here. And I, and I left. And like Mark said, I, I don't remember even calling the academy. That's what's crazy. I really have no idea that I did that. But I, what I do remember is coming in that, uh, that area sideways when I turned into the academy. I was going there so fast to get my brother. And I, we ran in and I, the, the director was this guy, Charlie Osak. He was the greatest guy. And he was like, what the heck? And I said, Charlie, we're under attack. I need Mark. And he goes, oh, you know, we got to dismiss the academy. You know, and they, they, they I think. They round everybody up outside, if I remember correctly. And they said, listen, this is Officer Magna. He just informed us that, you know, our nation's, you know, being attacked. The Pentagon was hit. I want you all to report to your commands. So I was the one that dismissed the Essex County Academy because they had no freaking clue. The director looked at me and trusted me because he knew my father. He knew me, you know, and uh, I got Mark in the car and I said, we're going to get Mike. And I didn't know where Mike was. I just figured go to his headquarters. And, uh, but we want, I wanted to show Mark because I saw those things. I saw those buildings fall and it was just something like, Oh my God. And I had to show Mark because he wouldn't believe me. No way, dude. He goes, there's, there's no way, man. 
I go, Mark, I'm going to bring you to the High Lawn Pavilion. And when we pulled over there, that's a beautiful spot in Essex County that you could like overlook the city. And all it was was like dust. And Mark's like, dude, I'm like, Mark. And Mark was young, like, you know, he's my little brother. And, and you know, he wasn't a cop yet. And he was just like in disbelief. He was in the training and it was like, oh, I've seen some things. I don't know. Like he didn't see things that Mike seen things as a police officer. And uh, it was disturbing. So we got in my truck and I had a new truck. We flew down to Pompton and my brother came out of his headquarters and he was like, come on, you know, we're going to go down. We went to some first aid, like they said, we loaded up and I said, I'm not taking my brand new truck into the city, man. We went to my house in Belleville. We switched vehicles. We had a red light, like Mike said. I remember going down the highway. We were on the wrong side of the highway. Some blue light special guy, that's what Mark would call him, was like, we got in front of him and he was like kind of moving cars. And then a real cop came and then we were like behind him. And then all of a sudden, like Mike said, Fish House Road. I remember a carny cop was standing there and he moved the barricade. And when we went on one and nine, like, and that was a busy highway, it was like that movie Daylight with Sylvester Stallone. I'll never forget it. It was completely desolate there was nobody on the friggin' road at all like this isn't real and, that, and i'm driving i was moving and i kept we kept reminiscing about my father because we figured he would be dead because we knew he was going to respond we knew he would be there and just to watch those buildings fall how is my father alive it was you know crazy so we make it we get into that bad car accident like mike said uh it was the it was actually a female cop sharon it was my dad's friends, his partner's friend. So she, she informed us. That's what like Mike said about he was alive. We didn't know where. I never saw my old man cry. He wasn't the type to cry. When he got out, when he found us, when he just appeared, it was like, oh, my God. My dad was like a wreck. Yeah. And uh, he was a wreck. So he just said, come on, boys. And he took us through the Holland Tunnel. And. I remember the movie Godzilla. Like that was one of my movies. I was, when I was a kid, I was scared of. And when I was walking through there and my neck was like this, looking up on these buildings that were just piled. Like, and like Mike said, the heat on some, Oh, it was intense. You couldn't even move. And I kept saying to my dad, dad, is this really, it's like, it's like Hollywood. He goes, look at this. Look what they did to my city. He was so angry. He was like, you know, look at this. I'm like, you know, and then, I remember being separated from Mike and Mark and my dad's like, son of a bitch, where'd they go? I told him to stay by my side. And he was getting, I'm like, dad, it's okay. And then we heard the horns and then we weren't like right, right where building number seven. We were like on the other, other side or something. Me and my father, after the building fell, he was like, gee, he was so mad. He thinking that Mike and Mark are dead. I don't know. I'm like, I don't know where they are. We finally reunite with them. And he was yelling at all, yelling at them. And they're like, dad, we jumped on it. And he's like, but if you ask my father, he don't remember it. He said to me, I told you not to come. That's all he'll say. I don't even remember you being there. It's crazy. So now we stayed there for a long time. You know, we were right in the heart of this. Like, I remember like, and I took a lot of pictures and stuff too, which you weren't supposed to, but like, you know, it was like, oh my God, you know, had a little disposables back then, which actually helped when we had to register into the program. They got all this proof and stuff they, they needed from you which thank God, you know, but me and Mike, um, when we got in that car accident, Marky landed on our backs. And I thought like, I didn't know what happened. Mike's like, we were in a car accident. So I'm like, get off of me. So Mark's like, Oh man, what the heck? Well, Mike broke his shoulder. Like he really hurt his shoulder bad. And he was complaining immediately. And I'm like, yeah, dude, Mike, Mike, oh, I'm like my neck, but you know, young, strong, you know, you're not thinking about that. The adrenaline, we wind up going to the hospital, like late, that night like three in the morning because i remember uh i saved an armband and you know i was like wow we were just, i don't remember a lot and then i'm like wow i was here at this time and then i found like a police report that says that we got into the city like we were in a car accident at 1 30 so like my dates were like oh okay i thought that i thought we were there a little earlier so i had to like really i had proof you know and it helped me reflect and remember some more stuff because i'm pretty good like i don't remember some stuff but then some stuff comes and if i talk to like guys that i brought down there they're like yeah remember this i'm like holy christ yeah i do remember that so uh you know uh that night that morning i never went to sleep i know mike didn't either i know that i went to work and my captain said 
I was in the same clothes. They were disgustingly, they were, they were white. And he says, did you even sleep? I said, no, sir. He said, go home, sleep, and go, you know, go help your father. So I said, thanks, Cap. And I remember uh, signed in. I friggin' got on the phone. I called my buddy, Dean. I said, Dean, I'm going to go home. It was like eight in the morning, uh, nine, 10. You know, I said, I think I slept for two hours. He was at my house at 10. And we went on Wednesday from like 10 on. But, you know, I don't know if you want me to continue with my stuff now or give it back to Mike and he could tell us about his days or what would you like us to do? Well, all of you are suffering from 9-11 illnesses, including your dad, correct? And our uncle. Yeah, there was five in our family. And my uncle was a lieutenant on Newark. And he responded, I don't, we never even, like, he went with Newark, um, not with us three. But uh, yeah, he's also sick. And then my father and then my brother, Mike, my brother, Mark, and myself. I mean, if you want Did me to start. Just a question here. Did you all volunteer on the pile after this or was this your only time? After that day, number Tuesday, which was like, the, I guess, 11, 9-11 was on a Tuesday, which was 11th. The 12th was Wednesday. I went in with Dino, who uh was in the marine reserve so i told him dude you, you're not a cop you know just wear your uniform there's army people all over the place so they were start they weren't really cracking down yet so we went there we would meet my father at post 20 which is where he worked and then he would drive us right in so me and dean were there on wednesday we were digging and you know just there for like 10 hours on thursday i went back and um thursday is when I guess when building number seven fell, like people don't really like it buried other people because on Thursday we uncovered a New York city fireman and a Newark fireman, like 10, 15 feet under the ground. I got like pictures of that when they came out, it was bizarre because we were like, how the heck did a New York city fireman and a Newark fireman get trapped together? And then that's when it clicked to me was that had to be from the rubble. That's the only logical, unless they fell in a trap because like Mike said, you would walk and there would be like, well, you can't go that way. That's like 20, 30, 40 feet. I remember being so naive. There was steam coming out and I, I had my glove on, but I went and I, it burnt me so bad through my, it was like an oven. And somebody goes, what are you nuts? He goes, that's coming from the ground, bro. And I'm like, dude, I didn't think I was, a, you know, I was a kid. I'm like, what's that? You know, that really, but so on, anyway, on Thursday, we, you know, we were there and they, um, we actually on, I think Wednesday is when I, that was, what's crazy Wednesday when me and Dean went back, we found a bar, like a rat, like that's when we were really starting to like skirt our way around. I was getting to know like the ins and outs of like, you know, you can't go that way. You got to go through this gateway building, climb through, go down the stairs. It was like a, it was a huge area. And once you learned it, you had, you, you had to do these routes or you couldn't get from one area to the next. So on Wednesday, we, um. We found the, uh, I think Wednesday was, they blew the millennium horn, right? Wednesday, Mike? One of the days, I can't remember, me and Dino, it was, uh, they blew the horn. It was every day they thought the millennium building was going to fall. It was swaying a lot. So we were on the actual pile and they, it was crazy. We started running for our lives. And we, there was a, like my brother, Mike, he hopped on a, fire truck well me and dean we saw this garbage truck and it had a flat face like not like a garbage truck in the country like it was a city garbage truck and we jumped on the bumper and we grabbed onto the windshield and we were like go oh, keep going we were screaming at the, the guy and he was an african-american driver and he was like trying to maneuver this truck and he was doing a phenomenal job but we saw everybody running for their lives and i'm like slow down and we tried helping people onto the garbage truck well me and dino we helped these two people on the garbage truck and it was our father and the son and we this garbage truck got us all the way to fulton market so i don't really know how far manhattan where the ground zero was to fulton market but it took us like an hour and a half and some change to walk back and we were like where are we you know we were had to figure our way back I'm, i wasn't like familiar with the city like that you know i was a essex county sheriff not a new york city cop you know and that was the day too that i saw which I thought was crazy. Mike, I remember seeing that homeless, it was a homeless guy, by the way, directing traffic. So I was like, what the heck? And I was seeing Newark police officers that I knew 
driving New York City police cars, patrolling New York City, which was like, what the heck? But everyone did like, I remember, like Mike said, body parts. I remember on the day with Dino on Wednesday, a trooper, a state trooper, New Jersey state trooper was running with a bag of body parts throwing up. And me and Dean were like, oh my God. So I ran to help him and I grabbed the bag and there was like some makeshift more and there was people in it. Like, you know, and I handed him the bag and I opened a door and I saw like just things that like, I don't know what they were. They were, you know, they were body parts. And me and Dean were like, holy, you know, my God. And he's like, dude. And then when we were walking back, somebody screams my name, Magna. So I'm like, who knows me in the city? And it was this uh, Richardson, one of the kids I worked in juvenile with. He was, as soon as this happened, he was Army National Guard. He got activated immediately. Yeah, you work with Richardson. Mark, you work with him too. So this kid Richardson, I knew him in juvenile. Now I'm a sheriff and he sees me and he calls me out. And I, I ran back to him like, what's up? He goes, dude, I'm activated. I don't know how long I'm going to be here. I'm like, be careful, bro. You know, and uh, I, I actually wind up, uh, what am I going to? That was Tuesday, Wednesday, Friday. I didn't see the president. My brother was there when the president was there. Saturday, I went back um, by myself. Um, Sunday, oh, I'm sorry. Friday, I took this girl Muzio with me. She was a female from the Essex County Sheriff. Everybody wanted to go and they knew my father. Like, you know, they, he worked there. So I had like the connection and living, working in Newark, it was 20 minutes to the city. So hey, Chris, can you bring me over? I'm like, uh, yeah. So I took the one girl on Friday and Sunday and then guys from the department, they heard that I was going over and they asked me, hey, can you bring me over? So I took like five dudes and we met my father and my father drove us in and we dug all night that night. We did that like Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Friday, the Essex County Sheriff calls me in and I'm like, oh no, I'm in trouble. Cause when he calls you, you know, it's not good. And he said, listen, do not bring one more officer over to the city. Are we clear? I said, yes, sir. He goes, you, you can do what you want. That's your father down there. I know your father. You want to go help do what you got to do, but do not. I said, yes, sir. So then the guys were like, are we going today? I'm like, no, dude, you can't go with me. Find your own way. And, and I think after the first week and a half, it was so tight down there with the Army National Guard and FEMA. Like, and the only reason why I was getting in because of my dad, you know, my dad, had a poor authority car. You meet him in Jersey. You went over with him. He dropped you off. We were digging with the poor authority guys, like, you know, all his guys that lived, the, the younger kids and everything else. And, and I just kept going back because I'll be honest with you too. I was young and I was living on my own with my girlfriend and I wasn't the best like cooking for myself. And my father would say to me, Chris, poor authority. They got all these great cooks and chefs because they really the poor authority is like the best agency around they really took yeah they in restaurants were helping so i would get out of work and i go have dinner with my father which was the best you know we i'd ask him how he was feeling you know and he's like well we didn't find anybody today he was really really searching for his friends he, he like I, I gotta say he, you know in the beginning and then my father became like a like uh, the guy, if you needed something, he knew the area and everybody made him do different things. And he, he was, my father was one of those cops that if you needed something, you went to my father, he was that guy. And uh, I was there for about a month and a half. And, and I think after, cause I, like I said, my, even my girlfriend, who's my wife, she used to say, can you leave your clothes at the bottom of the stairs? You smell like dead people. I'm like, dude, I don't smell anything. She goes, Chris, I worked in a hospital with a morgue. You smell like dead people, please. I don't know what's on your clothes. And I used to have to get undressed at the bottom of our, you know, stairs, leave all my stuff and run up. And she made me jump in the shower. And I never even knew I stunk. And, you know, after a while, I had my helmet. Like, I had a white helmet that I, and I remember, like, when we moved, I, I threw it away. I was just like, fuck, excuse me. I was so, I get so angry, you know, especially like, you know, you know, especially now being sick and my brother, like things like I look at things and I'm like, you know what? I just, I don't have an interest. You know, I, I, when I talked to him, like, especially I knew we had to talk to you guys, like to you. And I called Dean. I'm like, Hey, what do you remember? And he was like, blah, 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 blah. You know, and I called uh, the guy in the fire truck. I mean, the garbage truck. Um, 
he's actually the Warren County Sheriff and, you know, he's got conditions wrong with him. I reunited with the Warren County Sheriff because I, right now with uh, any of my friends that I took, I know they're sick and nobody wants to get help. And with the deadlines and everything else, I, I, I feel like I have to speak and they like, like the, what you're doing, I feel like to my friends, Hey, I took you there. I feel responsible. Like the narcotic division, for instance, I worked in narcotics for a while in Essex County. And I remember seeing the day of nine 11 that day. And then like maybe midnight, they were positioned on the West side highway. They were just sitting there. Like they were covered in dust. And, you know, I always said to myself, man, I want to get in that unit one day. And when I got in that unit, I, had, I was due for my uh, annual 9-11, you know, WTC medical monitoring program at Dr. Udison. And uh, I had to go to my director and say, hey, I got to go to be screened for 9-11. He says, for what? I said, I went down there. He goes, how did you go there? I explained to him. And a couple of the guys were like, Magna, you went down to ground zero. I said, yeah, I saw you. I saw you. I saw you. And they're like, you did? I go, yeah, you guys were standing there. I'll never forget it. Well, out of some of those guys, my friend Daryl, I think in 08 or 10, cancer, they had no idea what was wrong with him. My partner, I made him register in 2016, I think. And he's like, dude, they won't believe I was there. I said, dude, you were there. The sheriff sent you. He wound up getting prostate cancer. So everybody's catching stuff. So all my friends that like, again, I have friends right now that I call and they won't even answer the phone. Like I'm some type of like harasser but I just like feel obligated. I took you there, please get checked. You know, Chris, I'm watching what, my- what, tell us about your health issues. So <laughs> I don't know. I was going every year to Dr. Udison, just going there and, you know, taking breathing this and breathing that. And in 2002, I, I realized I was getting a lot of sinus infections and I would go to my primary care doctor and, you know, I had, I had a kid. So if I was sick, go back to work, man. I got to make money. And he, I was sick, like bronchitis, like 14 times. And, uh, he was just like, dude, you should have never went down to ground zero. So anyway, when I got diagnosed, this is what I got diagnosed with chronic rhinitis, chronic sinusitis, chronic laryngitis, chronic bronchitis, upper and lower respiratory disease. They found a 20% blockage in my right lower airway. And that was the thing. I kept saying I was sick and they were like, well, you know, you're not showing, you're breathing well. And I'm like, well, why do I take all these inhalers and all these pills? And I was getting angry because like they didn't want to like get to the bottom of it. Finally, Dr. Sotolongo, she was our pulmonary specialist. She's like, well, you know what, Mr. Magna, I'll have to go in and look with a scope. I said, I don't care. Whatever you got to do, let's figure it out. When that lady, when I came out of recovery, she was, she had to look like, I'm sorry. Because I was like, why are you looking at me like that? She says, because I really didn't think I was going to find anything, son. And I found something. I said, what? She's like, you have like a, like a polyp, like a, like it's like a cyst in my right lower airway, my capillary. And what happens when I get a common cold, it swells, it flares up and it blocks my thing. And then I get immediately chronic bronchitis. So my, right now I have a permanent wheeze. If, if anybody stuck a stethoscope to me, they're going to be like, you're wheezing. I'm like, no, I feel great. Thank you. That's my norm. Now I take a breathing pill. I have CO. So I, I, I said the rhinitis, I have the spot in my uh, lower airway, PTSD, anxiety, gastro reflux disease, obstructive sleep apnea. Um, in, in the, the asthma COPD overlap syndrome, some clinical, I have COPD. I'm, I'm 40 six years old and at the age of some 40 42 i take the offline 600 that's a lot that's a my 9 11 they didn't want me to take that pill it's like a breathing pill it keeps my capillaries open and actually it it helps me you know uh so i don't get it i I guess it keeps my airways open so i don't they don't swell and shut because i go from like a common cold to i can't breathe and i think i'm dying and i'm on like the normal person takes a prednisone pill like a 50, like 50, 40, 30, you know, that regimen. Well, I'll take 50 milligrams for a week, 40 milligrams for a week. So I take a lot of medicine and I'm sick. You know, I'm not as sick as my, like my sickness is manageable by medicine. Thank God. I don't like it. 
I don't know how long I'm going to be dealing with it because COP has life expectancies too. And I read, but like my brother, Mike, that's, you know, it's not fixable, his stuff, which I'm going to let you hear from him and Mark. I can't think of anything else except that, uh, you know, it's my family's been affected by this. Our whole family, I'll say that. My wife has put up with me, uh, my moods. You know, if I'm, if my brother Mike is uh, real, real, not having sick and I got to hear it from my mom subconsciously, like it eats at me. I might be angry with like Mark or Mike, but we're all sick and we went through the same thing and we're sick from the same nonsense. And so you have to, I'm learning now to put the shit to the side and just, we got to stick together because who knows, you know, I look at my brother, he's on dialysis. Anyone knows when you're on dialysis, it is what it is. So here's Mike. Okay, thank you, Chris. Hi, I'm back. <clears throat> so uh, after going down to the city for, I did 11 days in the city, like Chris did the most in the city. He, uh, he was there all the time, but I, I did 11 days. And after, after 11 days in my book, I felt that everyone had, had been dead. You know, 11 days to me was uh, pretty much, it brought me to around like October 1st because I didn't go every day. So like I would go, you know, maybe two days and then, you know, I'd sleep in the city and be there and then I'd come home and go to work and then I'd go back to the city. And so I only did, you know, 11 days. And like I said, I didn't find anybody. I, you know, did the, bu the bucket brigade and stuff like that. And, uh, you know, that should have been the end of my story. And then uh, I guess it was maybe 2005, maybe three, three years later, I started urinating blood and, uh, you know, I went to the doctors and, you know, they thought I had an ulcer or something like that. So I went to a urologist and the urologist told me that uh, you only bleed, you know, three ways, your kidneys, your bladder and your urethra. And since I checked your urethra and your bladder, you know, the only way you could be possibly bleeding now is from your kidneys. So you're in the wrong department. You're going to have to see a nephrologist. So I went from a urologist to a nephrologist. And then they, uh, they said I was definitely bleeding from my kidneys. They were unsure what was wrong with me. So I had bone marrow biopsy, kidney biopsy. And then uh, when they got my results, they, they said they had never seen anything of what I had. And they sent it to a specialist. And the specialist said he has no idea what, he, what I have. And he's the renowned specialist. And he suggests I go to the Mayo Clinic and maybe they could, you know, figure it out because he has no idea. So... I went always up to Mayo Clinic in Minnesota to see what, you know, if they could stop my kidneys from uh, failing. And uh, their only thing they could come up with because they had never seen my disease was uh, they wanted to treat me with uh, chemotherapy and they, I would be the first person to uh, undergo it. And they were unsure on how my reaction would be because I don't have cancer. I have a disease. And uh, I wasn't really willing to be the first participant of chemo on a disease that they, you know, were going to wrap, you know, make me like a, a, a what do you call it? Guinea a, a guinea pig. So I, I didn't do it. I uh, refused to do chemo. And then three years later, I, uh, my kidneys failed. And that was uh, February of this year of two, 2020 my kidneys failed completely and uh they put a port in my stomach and i'm on dialysis and i have to do dialysis every day and i need a kidney transplant and uh that's where i'm at i'm i'm on dialysis with a kidney transplant i have uh chronic bronchitis or chronic chronic bronchitis chronic Sinusitis, rhinitis. I have all the stuff that my brother has. PTSD, except PTSD, anxiety. PTSD, anxiety, all the other crap. Uh, I just, uh, I need a kidney transplant. Is what I need. So that sucks. And that's I'm what so I. Sorry. That's what I do now. I, uh, Before we talk to Mark, what is your? What are the health effects on your father? Uh, my father had a heart attack uh, after 9-11. They had him working, uh, you know, 14, crazy 14, 16-hour days, I think it was. He, he and he did it for like a year, hours. year and a half. He worked uh, mandatory 12-hour shifts for 18 months. 
Yeah, he yeah had, but it was also it was, he had twelve hour shifts for eighteen months, and afterwards day off, he, day he day had one day off. off. And, and then, then uh, he had a heart attack. They would let him work if he wanted to, and they would put him up for a couple hours. He worked all the time. Yeah. So he had a heart attack, and now he has a stroke. He retired. He had a stroke. A mini, bunch, of strokes. bunch of mini strokes. Uh, and he a has chronic, uh, spots chronic, on his lungs and stuff chronic, like that. Sinusitis. Yeah, he's he's sick too. Oh, I forgot. It. Here. And and Mark. Um, Mark's got a, here, hold on. Hey, I'm back. <clears throat> so you, you were saying, so I went back a bunch of times after the initial 9-11, the day of 9-11. So I went back Saturday, um, did, you know, did whatever I could. Um, I went, I went up, I went, I went a lot of times because even after it was all over, you knew nobody was alive. Even months later, I just wanted to see the progression because I worked in Newark and my father, I was living with my father, so my father was never home. So even like up, up until two, up until June or July, I mean, I went back to see all the progression. So I was always there. But um, my conditions, I have chronic rhinitis, sinusitis, sleep apnea, GERD. Um, I had a tumor removed from my right side in 2014. I have nasal polyps, um, anxiety, and um, a lot of anxiety, uh, PTSD. I'm 43 years old. I just turned 44, but uh, I had a, you know, I, I was um, I was defecating blood for a, a while. So I went to go see Dr. Udison, and Dr. Udison wanted me to go get a colonoscopy. So I just had a colonoscopy uh, the week before July 4th. You had a medical break. Yeah. Know. And um, so I had my colonoscopy. They found two polyps. One was like five centimeters, and one was like 10 centimeters. And they found a third polyp, which is a different kind of polyp. It was like uh, 30 centimeters, almost three quarters of an inch. And I guess he said if that would have been in me for like another year, it would have been can uh, colon cancer. So, um, make a long story short, I'm in recovery. They're sending me out of the hospital and I'm walking out, I see my wife in the car, I'm getting, re I'm getting ready to open the hospital doors. All of a sudden I felt I had to go to the bathroom. I said to the nurse, do you have a bathroom? She showed me the bathroom. I went in and uh, it was all blood. So I opened the door, she was like, holy crap. She threw me in the wheelchair, brought me back downstairs. Uh, I went to the ER, I wound up having emergency surgery because the doctor, I guess, messed up when he, when he, um, clip, when he clipped the big polyp out of me. And um, I, I woke up and I had a blood transfusion. I had to get two bags of blood. So I almost died. So it, it was kind of crazy because I remember laying there. It was like an hour went by. I'm like, holy shit, like I'm still bleeding. And um, yeah, it, it, it was. Uh, and then when I started getting dizzy and I couldn't really, you know, everything started like fading out. Then finally, they, 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 they finally got me in there to do, do the emergency surgery. I, I had a mental breakdown. I was, I was in a hospital for about a, um, four days five days i was in the carrier clinic um you know i i just i'm i'm young i was really young and, and and you know watching my brothers my own problems and watching my brothers it's um it's been tough you know and and i didn't accept being sick because you gotta remember 2000 2001 happened two, i started getting sick in 2000 january 2002 i started throwing up in my mouth and that's when i started going to my primary and they said, oh, you, you, you got uh, indigestion. So it gave me Nexium. I said, okay. And then uh, I started getting like sinus infections. I mean, I averaged like nine to 10 sinus infections a year. So I, ha I have to eventually get nasal surgery because I got polyps. And um, where was I? Where, lost my train of thought for a second. So you're just a wreck. He is. He really is a wreck. It, it, it's, it, it's, you know, so that back to what I was saying. So I, I was young. So in 2006, my brother's like, oh, you got to go to uh, get, you, get, get checked out for 9-11. I was like, what the hell are you talking about? I said, There's, I'm fine. He was like, no, you got to go get checked out. So I kind of blew it off because I, you got to remember when Governor Whitman told everybody, I mean, I remember going into the city and all they talked about how the air quality was fine. So for all those, you know, they always talk about the air quality. And, and so I was in, up until 2011, I was in denial about being sick because I said, there's no, there's no way the government will lie to us. No possible way we can get sick from ground zero. They said it was safe. And I remember hearing, I remember hearing on, you know, Z100 all the time. And, um, yeah, I remember. 
And then I got married in 2008. I had my first kid 2009, my second kid 2010. So I was still in denial. So, you know, now I'm a new husband, new dad. And now, now I'm sick. And now this is the life I, I'm living. And, you know, I feel bad for my wife and kids, but I'm trying my best. You know, it, I can't work. And, you know, I went through the whole entire process of workman's comp like my brothers did. And it, it was absolutely disgusting that it took us. I mean, they don't even pay for our medical. They, they yeah, it, it, it's. I should be getting ready to retire right now from a job associated with my brothers. I should be getting a good amount of money. I don't I mean, I make peanuts. I make peanuts. And it's it's just this this, this whole thing's just been a disaster. You know, it, it's it's something that I got to live with every day. I got to talk to my brothers as much as I can see them as much as I can. But as far as, like, it, it, it's my brother's on dialysis. He's fucking 46 years old. For, I'm sorry, 48 now, right? 48. 49. Uh, it's, it's just, you know what it is? You don't know what, you know, most people are like, oh, you can't really wonder. But for us, it's like, what's, what, what comes next? Like, what comes next? Because now I have to go next Monday for another colonoscopy because the doctor never took the rest of that polyp out of me. So I have to get the rest of it removed. So um, it just never ends. I mean, we're we're living our lives of doctor's office visits and and fucking tests. That that's and, and seeing psychologists once a week and psychiatrists once a month. So, you know, it, it's it's been a, it's it's taken a toll on all of us, my whole family. Are you? Do you have regrets? And are you angry? I'm very angry. Um, I'm I'm the angriest I'm at is because we were lied to. I mean, I, the only thing I can say is at least the Russians, when Chernobyl happened, they told the people, hey, if you want to be heroes, we'll take care of your family. And if you live, we'll take care of you. Us, they lied to us for all these years. And the compensation is, it's. You need, you need to have cancer to get money. Like, I don't have cancer. And uh, I, didn't, I didn't get a lot of money. I lost my house. Like, you know, where's my American dream? You know, um, I went down to help out people and now. I'm sick as shit and I lost my house because of it, because the bank doesn't care. I can't work. I can't, you know, pay my bills. They don't want to hear that. You know, and I can't work because, because I'm sick. I'm sick because I went down to nine 11. So the bottom line is I lost my house and uh, that, that, you know, I just feel like a loser. I lost my house. I lost my marriage. I lost my health. Not only that, I lost my job. You, you know, I mean, it's just, you, you just, you just, you just keep losing. I mean, I live with my girlfriend now. She pays the thing. I mean, if we're great, everything's fine. But I mean, realistically, if she wanted to throw me out, where am I going? I don't have a house. You know, I don't have anything. Do, do you all regret doing what you did? Not one bit. I don't regret it. You know I, why? I regret going I down there because I went down there to find people and I didn't find anybody. And, uh, I do believe they used this because they had to clean up New York City. They 100%. had to get it. They had to get the stock. They had market to get open. the stock market 100%. back. They had to get stuff back to normal. And uh, you tell American people that we can't ever go back to Manhattan. You could never tell American people, "Hey, we have to um, leave it like you know where they dropped the A bomb in Nevada. Go try to go over there and go in there. You can't go, but it by Canary Islands where they dropped the the A bomb. You can't go near it. Why?" Because when we, when I got registered in that program, when I got registered in that program, I never forget Dr. Udison, um, the, the psychologist, the uh, pulmonologist. And they said, hello, Mr. Ma this is Dr. Udison. I love her to death. Hi, Christopher. Um, I'm Dr. Udison and I'm going to med I'm going to monitor your health for the rest of your life. I looked at her, I go for the rest of my life. She's like, do you know what a catastrophic event is? So I looked at her, I'm like, I looked at the team and I go, yeah. Uh, she's like, can you name one? I go, Hiroshima. They were like, excellent. And I stood up and I said, are you telling me I'm going to die of cancer? Oh, we don't know what's going to happen, but we're going to monitor your health. I forgot to add in 2018. If I take these out, these are hearing aids. I'm, I was one of the first New Jersey police officers to get a phone call and I didn't ask i was hoping they would tell me i was going deaf from shooting guns and they told me no you've been exposed to a toxin that they found in 2018 and it's going to deteriorate it deteriorates hearing 
eyesight and sinuses. Well, I got to take Advil cold and sinus. I live on it every day. It's got, uh, if I don't take that, I can't breathe. Like, you know, in, in my Zizol and my uh, Theophylline and my Singular 10 and my, uh, 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 my, inhal my inhalers. How old were you all when you all retired? I was in my 30s, late 30s, I guess, like uh, 36. I was 35. No, you were, yeah. I was 30. I actually was, I should have retired and when she found that spot in my lead. And if you even asked Dr. Unison, this lady used to constantly tell me, Christopher, I think you need to look for a new line of work. And I said, Doc, are you nuts? I got freaking kids. I'm not going on disability and crap. Christopher, you're sick. I didn't go out. I didn't want to do anything because I was a police officer and I was I had carried a gun. But my PTSD, you mentioned PTSD as a cop. On my department, they take your gun. So, you know, I didn't want to retire, try to go in, you know, so I stayed on the job and I actually got hurt in the line of duty. And I say it was a blessing because I blew my shoulder and it was a injury that I was able to get a pension and, and leave the job that way. And then I went right and started checking on my lungs because and had, then I was allowed to mention PTSD. You know what I'm saying? Because I didn't want to say it when I was going through my pension because they would have said I was crazy and they would have gave me no pension. It's, it's a game. It's disgusting. Just like my 9-11 psychiatrist says, now I was a cop that did not believe in marijuana. Like I just didn't believe in it. It was, if you, I worked in Newark, everybody smoked it. And you could ask my two brothers. I would tell you, if you smoked pot, you were a junkie. That's what I would say. It was my vocabulary. Oh yeah, whatever, dude, like a junkie, rely on alcohol. Like that was me. For me to smoke marijuana, people hated me. Like who the hell is he? But when 9-11 doctors, and I trust them, said, look, Mr. Megan, you take a lot of um, PTSD medicine, other medicines for your um, stomach. And uh, I met a rescue worker, this guy, Greg Fodor. I met him up by my house. He was a lieutenant, NY, NY Fire, great dude. And uh, he had, uh, he's the one who told me, you know, you should smoke some pot. And I was like, what? I said, no, thank you. And he goes, listen, I bet you I know what's wrong with you. And he named my illnesses. So now I thought he was some and i'm like dude who are you but He's how like, do you a... smoke pot with breathing issues well my pulmonologist says if it doesn't like here marijuana is a inflammatory it's a anti-inflammatory smoke okay people don't it's a healing smoke it's been around it grows from the earth it does never i never smoked a cigarette in my life i first thing i asked my 9-11 pulmonologist if you tell me not to do this i will stop tomorrow he says not going to tell you it has nothing to do with your lungs mr magnet it doesn't if it doesn't give you the nick it doesn't destroy your lungs like tar and nicotine he goes does it make you cough i said not at all i said it actually calms me down a little bit he goes then um i'd like you to continue smoking and as a matter of fact when you were very sick i said i still smoke it you know why it's a breathing exercise for me when you smoke marijuana what are you doing <sighs> i'm exercising my capillaries so when i'm sick I can't, my, my, my chest hurts. So I'm forcing myself to exercise, believe it or not. So in, in, my, in, in my stomach, Dr. Unison had me taking Nexium for five years and Dexalim for five years. Okay. Well, guess what? Those medicines, all medicines kill your liver, your insides. And what do I think about? Well, my brother, Mike has kidney disease. I have a friend that got it. I don't, everything goes to your kidneys. So I would take, I take a lot of pills. I don't want to take pills. So this was an, a, a relief for me not to take a couple of pills. They lowered some of my anxiety medicine, believe it or not, which was phenomenal. And, but again, why are we paying for this medication? New York city, like we went down there, they prescribe it and they tell us, well, it's not federally legal, but you prescribe it. So again, I'm wasting my money. And I said, like I had Lee London, and Bash McGarry. So I settled my case. Great law firm. Um, I want to thank Mr. Zadroga for getting this whole thing going with the, you know, the, the Zadroga fund, because I spoke to him, actually, the father, when my brother was fighting everything, because again, how do you not certify kidney disease? They should be, listen, how do you not certify hearing loss? Do, are we making this up? We're not making this up. They told me, Mr. Megna, you're, you're 
A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, M, N, O, P, but we'll only pay for A, B, C, and D. Oh, and with this victim compensation, they don't pay for anxiety and PTSD. My brother had to go to a mental institution. But then that's not, you know, your brain's not worth any uh, monetary value. That's what the VCF says. So things got to change. Things got to change. My brother's got to get a certification for his kidney disease. Not only my brother. And, and I, he, Mike cares about Mike, but I care about everybody. People that are sick need to get the certifications they need. This autoimmune deficiency disease, you know, they certified every cancer in the book. Awesome. They should. I met a lady down there that, here real quick. I met a lady when we saw that um, big tire, like my brother would never forget. I'll never forget that tire in the middle of the street from the airplane. Cause I was like, I never got up that close to an airplane tire that I could touch it. And I was like, damn, and it looked just, it didn't look like it belonged there. You know what I'm saying? It didn't look like it belonged there. And I remember there was a Starbucks like along the, um, somewhere on the outskirts. And it was so cool because everybody wanted to help and they hooked up generators. And I remember going in there, right? And like everything was broken, but they hooked up a generator and this lady was serving like coffee. She was giving you cigarettes, chewing the back. She gave you whatever you wanted. And, you know, me, I was smiling. And years later, I move up to where I moved to. And uh, I'm in a haircutting, getting my haircut. And this woman is coughing her brains out. I said to her, you sound like me when I'm sick. She's like, oh God, ever since uh, I went down to ground zero, I turned, I looked at her, I said, were you in the Starbucks and we're working for the, uh, uh, what's that place? Uh, over there, over there. No, uh, hold on, the, Mar the Red Cross. I said, were you working for the Red Cross? This lady cried. She's super sick right now. I, a friend of mine gets his hair cut and he says, hey, do you know Kim? I said, yeah, I've talked to her. You know, she's got to get into the program and blah, blah, blah. Just, you know, what I would like to see happen, I'd like to see things get changed. I'd like to see more certifications. Um, I think uh, Bash McGarry and them and Mike are doing a great job what they're doing. John Stewart, what they're doing. But more has to get done. This guy, if there's only one doctor, Mike, what's the doctor that does the certifications name? Howard. Howard or maybe there's got to be more doctors. And I know we can't rush everything to be done right away, but it's been 20 years. How many more people, how many more people are going to get sick and die? We aren't getting better. Uh, and, you know, I'm watching every time I talk to somebody. Oh, yeah. I, and, and, and people and here's what's New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, like we know. But what about the cops that I, I met in um, uh, Seattle, Washington, Arizona? There was people that got in their cars and just drove because the city needed help. You know, and like Marky said. And Mike said, they left us there to clean up that entire city. Now, if you were if you were born tomorrow, you don't know nothing about what that city looked like unless we teach about it with history, you know? And uh, I don't know. Let's uh, give the phone back to Mike. I'm back. Anything else you want to add, Mike? Uh, nothing. I think Chris hit it on the head as far as they, you know, like I said, the certifications, it's been 20 years. And the way they work with the certifications is if you don't have a certification, they don't want to hear you. They don't, they don't admit that it's their problem and you get no compensation and you get no medical help. So as far as like my kidney disease, that's all been the VA. I've been going back and forth, you know, thank God I was a Marine and thank God I would, you know, I have the thank VA you, because otherwise I, I, I would have to pay all this stuff out of pocket, all this you know, and I got sick down there and they haven't, it just, it's so frustrating to know that, you know, I have doctor's letters saying that I'm sick from 9-11, that, you know, what I inhaled down there has deteriorated and destroyed my kidneys and it's all factual. And I hand all those papers in and, you know, hey, you know, looking for a certification and they, I get nothing, nothing. And like I said, when you don't have a certification, when you go to the 9-11 doctors, they don't want to hear about your kidney disease because it's not certified. They only want to treat, they can only treat you for what is a certified condition. So like I said, my kidney disease, you know, I, I, I contacted Barish and McGarry. I said, you know, I, I've got nothing, zero. I've lost everything. And they said, you know what we're going to do? We're going to combine your sleep apnea with your bronchitis and this and that. And you're going to have to go in front of a board and 
explain that you the reason why you can't work is because of your sinus and and I said, well, the reason why I don't work is because of my kidneys. They, well, you can't mention that because it's not a certified condition. So you have to just mention what's certified. So I basically go in front of a bunch of people and tell them, you know, hey, look, I, I can't breathe and I, I can't sleep. And because I can't sleep and breathe, I can't work. And I have to like just like maneuver my words to make it like a play on thing when the truth is I'm fucking, you know, I'm sick because of my kidneys, you know, my, my, my kidneys. You, they control everything. Your blood pressure. I have high blood pressure. My, I have gout. My, my, I have gout so much I can't even walk at times. Uh, and now, now my new thing is my skin's itchy, because your skin is an organ and it, it's controlled by your kidneys. And my kidneys are screwed up, so I, I itch all the time like a junkie. Like I, I, I itch for hours. I itch till I bleed. It's just like horrible, and it's just frustrating to know that. You know, I, I didn't, I didn't ask for anything. You know, I went down I helped out and that was it. I didn't ask for a, a, a thing. And now it's like, you know, I can, I, I can ask for everything I want. And they just look at me like, you know, like I'm in a, in a, a glass bubble and they can't help me. You're like, sorry, you know, we know you're sick. We know this, but there's nothing we can do. You're not, you don't have a certified condition, yeah, which I makes can. me want to choke these doctors. Like, you know he's so angry i am i'm not showing it but i'm i'm beyond I'm frustrated and angry i i've broken my hands i've broken my feet i've kicked holes in walls i've punched windshields i've gone through three different windshields i've broken tables his kids are suffering too yeah my and my kids watch me do it you know like they just watch me unfold and become some horrible man that you know destroys everything i bought you know like i broke my windshield i got to get it replaced you know, I put holes in the wall. I got to, I got to get it replaced. So it's just like, you know, I smoke pot now too, because, uh, I, I need to calm down. You know, I can't, I can't be, uh, I can't be on edge all the time. It's just not, it's not a way to live. Doctor, you just called me and said, they don't even like to see me. Like when I go to see the doctors, they'll call my brother, Chris, they'll be like, can you come with him next time? You were afraid of him. They are, you know, because, because I curse and I yell and yeah, I curse and yell because they're not sick. You know, they're not sick. They're telling me to calm down. You know, I don't know when, you know, I honestly, I think I'm going to die every day. Like, you know, I tell my kids, you know, when I'm dead, I want to be buried in my camis, you know, and I want, you know, bottles of water. And I tell them this because I'm serious. And, and then I watch you. them cry, you know, and I'm not doing it to upset them. Okay. I'm so sorry. Well, people will know about your suffering. Do you guys all have um, World Trade Center health card plans? You know, the yep. cards? Yeah. You want to hold them up? I can't sure. see the the, um, the cameras. It, the light keeps going off and on. Do you have yours? I got mine in my wallet. Mine's in my wallet. Hold on. Mine. But back to what I was telling you before. So like Mike was saying, I had that colonoscopy. And then I call Workman's Comp and I tell her, because now it's obviously there's a problem with my intestines, my lower intestines. So of course the lady's like, oh, uh, that's not certified. Now you're, we're gonna have to set up a court date and get a letter from the doctor. So like Mike was saying, it's, it's been, when you need help, they don't, you gotta fight for everything. And it's been such a, it's, it's been heartbreaking. And then, and then I had to go through the whole entire Workman's Comp. Like I had, I had to take it to trial because the insurance carrier which I never knew, I never knew nothing about this. They were trying to say that I wasn't disabled and I had to actually go the whole entire trial. I mean, obviously I won it because I proved my case, but in the, but you know, the thing I've learned from all this is that when you are, when you're, when you're legitimately sick, nobody gives a shit, nobody cares. And then you, and, and then they send you the, all these, all these workman comp doctors and they say, oh no, no, he's fine. I'm looking at the guy, like I, I get the report back. I'm like, this isn't even what I said. That's not even that like, you're da they downplay all your injuries and then workman comes trying to say oh he's you know only 80 88 you know disabled it's been it's, it the whole system needs to be revamped because obviously it's just it's disgusting how you how you're treated once you become injured nobody cares so that's what we're you know dealing with jesus chris what, what? you got the things all right here here's the cards mine's there's a my card 
I feel like a lot of our life was taken from us because all the times I've been sick. I mean, I used to go to, I used to, all those years I worked, I mean, I, I used to have to max out my sick days for sinus infections and all like stuff that started adding up to, you know, that was, that was 9-11 related, but I didn't, I was still in denial, which I'm still in denial. And, and I tell you, right. So I've always volunteered at this place called St. Paul's Abbey. And when I got the, like, when they told me like you have COPD and, and I realized like, you know, the doctor's like, you know, Chris, you're si- he said, he used to say to me, they do these PFT tests where they take, they take blood out of your artery in my wrist, which is like painful. They got a Novocaine in it, and that shows your true level of oxygen. So the doctor always says to me, my age and all the medication I take, you're sick, Mr. Magnum. I get about 10 minutes of full exertion and I'm done. So if I don't, if I can't like kick your ass in 10 minutes, forget about it. You're, I'm done. I can't breathe. And it's the worst feeling of my life, you know? And I was at this, uh, St. Paul's Abbey and I was in the, uh, it's a monastery and people always say like, dude, I'd love to have your life. I volunteer at a church every day. You know why? Because I'm a Catholic and I've always been a devoted Catholic, but there's nothing better from knowing that I'm going to die. I spend all my time. My best friend, you guys, my brothers is a freaking priest. Um, he, no, he's a priest. He's a Benedictine priest. And you know what he said to me? I, uh, you need um, to stay on monastery and help me. That will make you feel better. I, he knew I liked the title and I don't have a title anymore, man. I can't, I'm, I'm disabled. So he made me a volunteer security guard. And it, 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 I laugh because the guy looks at me and he says, you are very sick, but you're a Catholic and he'll take when you want. But I, I watch people die every day with this coronavirus, with this and with that. So I do believe in my faith. I do believe, you know, he'll take me when he wants to take me. But like my, my friends cannot believe that in my, like, I live on this monastery. I wouldn't, when I got my settlement, I wouldn't leave Andover, New Jersey because I'm sick and dying and I want to be close to the monastery. Is that crazy? But no, that's me. My best friend, he'll tell you, he calls me stupid. That's my nickname. He's Korean. They're Korean monks. And uh, I got to say, it's just emotional right now because, you know, I, I go to that cemetery every day And I pray for my brother, Mike, for my brother, Mark, and for anybody else that's sick. That's what I do. And if you're fucking sick, I talk to him. I'm not a fucking psychiatrist. I'm more, I have more mental problems than anybody, but I have no problem talking to somebody and making them feel better because that makes me feel better. So that's what I do. And I just wanted to share that with you. I'm good. I'm so sorry, but. Thank you, all of you, for for sharing. I'm just so sorry, but uh, and my brother Mike, he he is playing it down. When I tell you anger, what would you feel like if you had you have you have siblings, right? Sure. Yeah. Picture looking at your sibling and knowing what you everything you've been through. And me and him were tight. We were real tight. But when you're sick, not it's all about you. And I have to understand. I said some shitty shit to him. It's not my way. It's because I think a certain way. He thinks a certain way. And we're different people. But I just want to tell him I love you, Mike. I'm back. Thank you, guys. You're welcome. Spread the word, people who need to tell their stories. (laughs) And people need to sign up for the program. Thank you so much for doing this for us. Thank you.